Good morning, guys. I'm Frankie, for those of you who may not know me. Um, and if <laughs> and if we don't know each other, let's let's fix that. Let's know each other. Um, come talk to me. I like knowing people. Um, it's nicer when I'm speaking to friends than to a crowd. So yeah, let's let's fix that. Let's get to know each other. I'm going to start off this morning by holding up this ball and saying that this ball, for this morning at least, is going to represent our essence. Some might refer to this as the image of God within you, your inherentness. This is you at your core, stripped of everything else. This ball represents your true self. Joel uh, did a message a few weeks back in our Gutless series where he talked and just gave the whole message to talking about what our true self is. If you haven't heard that, or you need to, you're like, he did, but I kind of forget, this is me, um, you can go back and you can listen to the messages. I just go onto YouTube, I type in Connect Cranbrook, and it comes up with the Connect Cranbrook symbol, like the green with the arrows. And you can go back in the Gutless series, it's the second message in, and Joel talks about the true self. But for this morning, we're just gonna start here, that this is you. You as you were originally created. And it is beautiful and vulnerable. We would call this naked, if you will. Like this, you are exposed, susceptible to hurt, to ridicule, to damage, really. And so, like each of us do, we begin to construct our ego. We create the I that becomes us. We layer on our personalities, our favorite colors, our preferences, our sports teams, our likes and our dislikes. We've got our thought processes and our justifications, our logic and our reason, our defense mechanisms and our habits. And we get this nice layer that protects us. We'll even add on one more layer. We'll add on some like distrust and skepticism just for a good measure. And there we are. Our egos, they get a bad rap. But all they really are is the thing that separates you from me. And they're actually a very necessary part of life. And so, here I am. I am Frankie Hulse, my true self, wrapped in my ego. And from here, most of us would live out our days. But some of us will move past this. My son, Finn, he is three years old. And he is at the very early stages of ego development. Uh, those of you who have any experience with a three-year-old will understand that they go through this stage where um, in ego development is known as the tribal stage or the red stage. And it is where a person is testing power, power of themselves and power of those around them. And three-year-olds do that, don't they? Like this morning, we needed to be here on time so I could be on this stage and not be late. And uh, he was dressed in a Captain America outfit. And I had decided that Captain America wasn't going to church, that Finn was going to church. And uh, I went, Finn, we, just, we need to take off Captain America so you can be Finn. And he just like, within a moment, lost it. And he's like, but I don't have my shield. <laughs> I was like, let's go find the shield. Um, he's in this age. And, and He's also, in this stage, he's also um, at resisting the reality that he is not the center of the universe. And we all know that about three-year-olds. They do think they are the center of the universe. I did a whole message previously, and I started with, my son thinks he's the boss. Um, but all of this, what's really helpful for me, at least as a parent, is knowing that all of this is developmentally appropriate for him. This is where he is in life, and this is okay. It helps me most days to remind myself that the behaviors that I'm seeing, I can be 
I'm mostly assured that he's not going to become a manic psychopath. Some days I doubt that still, but it kind of, you know, it, it, it's comforting as a parent to know what is developmentally appropriate. Uh, his, his, his understanding of the world is also developing. Right now, he, when we're in the car, uh, in the evening, he sees the moon. He goes, Mom, the moon is following me. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Like, if you think about it, his understanding of the world, that makes total sense. I, on the other hand, tried to tell him that it doesn't. Um, and he didn't hear any of it and said, no, Mom, look, it's following me. And I was like, I, I realized in the car at that moment that explaining planetary orientation to a three-year-old <laughs> is not a useful, is, is not useful of my time. Um, that right now, in his, in his understanding, where he is developmentally, that's an, a completely appropriate understanding of the moon. And that's totally okay for him to believe that now. Because I know that in the future, that he is going to come to a deeper understanding of planetary orientation, and that there will be a rewiring in his synapses, in his understanding, if you will, that the moon doesn't actually follow us. And that's totally fine. Because he is on this developmental journey. We are on his personal, spiritual, emotional journey as well. But what a lot of us don't realize is that this ego development is only the first half of the journey. Most people end their development here, never realizing that there is a second half, the removal of our ego to regain our true selves. I don't know why Connect gives me these topics to cover. Like, <laughs> seriously, I'm pretty sure Joel and Frank, they sit down with the list of things that they're going to talk about, and they go, I'll take this one, you take that one, I'll take this one, you take that one. Who wants to take this one? No one. Let's write Frankie's name. <laughs> and then they conveniently aren't here this weekend. So, like, I can't even be like, guys, I can't do this. They're like, if you don't, no one will. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk often about the paradoxes of our faith. But that's what we're going to do today. It's necessary, but difficult. Paradoxes like the beautiful broken. Two words that we wouldn't usually put together. But somehow in faith, they do. The paradox that we are born to be reborn. That we are created to become a new creation. Other circles of thinking call this one transformation. Richard Rohr wrote an entire book entitled The Falling Upward. It doesn't always make sense and yet somehow it works. The second half of life is the removal of our ego and it's gonna require a process that is known as the pain, the waiting, and the rising. The paradox is this, that in order to heal, we must first be broken. Fun stuff, right? Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Joel. It's like Dr. Seuss says. I'm sorry to say, but sadly it's true, that bang-ups and hang-ups will happen to you. This whole entire message, you could just read the places you will go and add Jesus, and you're there. I thought about doing that. <laughs> we can find edges and we can begin to peel them back. But eventually, our egos are so developed and so tightly wound around our true selves that it's going to take some deep extraction to get back to that true self. And it's at this part of the journey that we run into our wall. Imagine a wall, okay? Did you get that? This is a wall. Okay, good. <laughs> Speaking of pain, do any of you remember a few weeks ago that it snowed? And sorry, it did. It did. How many of you are like me and that like just fills you with the most disgust? Who's disgusted by that? Yeah, that was me. Okay, so I'm assuming the rest of you, maybe show of hands, how many of you were like elated when it snowed? 
Yeah, yeah, see, you are sad, strange people. <laughs> you have my pity. My son Finn, when he woke up and saw the snow, he's three, right? So he gets up and he goes, mom, 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 can you, can, can you, he's so excited, can you get my pants, my snow pants and my snow jacket and my snow boots so I can make a snow angel? And I was like, why, you're crazy. But he's so excited, so of course I said, sure. So I go to our coat closet and I open it up and I realize I am not ready for winter. I have sandals and sunglasses and hats and beach blankets. I have not set this thing up for winter yet. We are not there. It made me realize that very soon, and I'm sorry guys, this is the first painful thing I know. Very soon, we are going to have to reorganize our closets for winter. It's not, uh, I don't like this reality, but it is true that I'm going to have to take some time and pull the things out of my closet that worked for a previous season, but aren't going to work for me in this coming season. Like our egos, this current arrangement of my closet was good previously, but now in this new season, it needs to be reorganized. Some things need to come out, some new things need to go in. And like seasons, our walls come whether we like them or not. But our walls have a value, and it is this, that they help us do the necessary reorganization of our hearts. It's also at the wall that we experience the first step of this process. It's known as the pain. This is the rattling of our world. It comes at a time often with loss. Um, it can actually come at any time, but loss is often associated with it. It could be a loss of a marriage, the loss of a person. Maybe it's the loss of a belief of your health or of just of hope. Like I said, it can come at any time though. A wall is what we get stuck at because we're on a journey and we're no longer moving forward. That makes sense, doesn't it? How many of you have felt stuck? Show of hands, who has felt stuck? Like metaphorically stuck. You may, maybe you've been stuck in a ditch, that's a whole different story, but this is like metaphorically in your person, you have felt stuck. That is your wall. Sometimes when we're stuck, we can feel that God is far away, that heaven has been closed. Being stuck can bring about feelings of hopelessness, weariness, the sense of being alone. There's a sense of failure or defeat in being stuck. Sometimes when you're stuck, we, call, we say that we're empty, dry or barren. But what's the same at every wall is that when we face these things, the old ways of coping with these feelings no longer work. The way that we used to deal with it isn't working in these situations. Christians are sometimes the worst at this. I am a Christian, I am allowed to say this, it's okay. I can admit that we sometimes are really not good at this because suffering and pain, they don't look good with the image that we are trying to portray, if we're honest. I know this because I've been in places of suffering and I have still shown up with smiles and singing joyful noises. Christians who are suffering can sometimes, they're not honest with themselves. They have no crosswords for God, none. And they keep saying over and over again with these plastic smiles on their faces, God is working everything for my good. They keep it together, they say, for the sake of others. And this is what we call denial. <laughs> this is a horrible testament to others what real faith looks like. How can we demonstrate to the world a healer when we can't admit that we hurt? Healthy faith. Healthy faith can say, I don't understand what God is doing. It can say, I'm hurt, 
I'm angry, I'm sad. Healthy faith, faith can admit that yes, this is a mystery and I don't know when it will end. And it can even say, God, why have you forsaken me? David wrote most of the Psalms in the Bible and he did a magnificent job at balancing feelings, feelings with belief. In Psalms 42, he says, even still, I will say to the true God, my rock and my strength, why have you forsaken me? Why must I live a life so depressed and cry endlessly while my enemies have the upper hand? David knew how to still be broken and still say the words, my true God, you are my rock and my strength. Because Emotional, healthy spirituality lets you feel while at the same time letting you believe. It's important then to know what our feelings are and what they are not. It sounds pretty simple, but I know some of you. You haven't got this figured out. How do I know? I don't know, because we're friends, right? That's how I know. Maybe because I know it in myself. <laughs> The things that we think and the things that we feel are not the same thing. Let's try it like this. If I asked you, this is like a practice, you ready? Ready, here we go. If I asked you, what do you feel about Frankie using a ball as the representation in her message? It's a weird question, but okay, I'll give it a try. Maybe you could say, well, I think it's mean that Frankie wrapped a ball up in masking tape. That is a thought. It's not a feeling. I think, I think it's mean of Frankie to do that. A feeling could be, I'm offended that Frankie would wrap a ball up in masking tape. Do you kind of see the difference? Let's try it with something a little bit more personal in our lives. Let's say we have a friend who has said something to us that's kind of offensive. We can think to ourselves, you know what? I'm just not gonna talk to them anymore, it's not worth it. There's some weight behind that thought, but it's not the feeling. There's actually a feeling behind that thought, and the feeling is, that person hurt me. I'm hurt. I don't trust them anymore. Thoughts can often come from a feeling, but we need to get to the feeling, because it's at the feeling that we can begin to work on our heart. Because our feelings can tell us of our heart's condition. When I finally say, I don't want to talk to that person because they hurt me, I can begin to ask, why did what they say hurt me? What am I believing in myself that makes that hurt? Feelings, go there because emotions are the messengers to be heard. They can tell us about our heart's condition. The second half of the journey is finding the imperfect habits that we have constructed our whole lives around, and now they hold our hearts captive. But the imperfect habits, I have to admit, they're deeply rooted. My imperfect habits, at least one of them, <laughs> is anger and resentment. On the outside, I am a very happy person. I, my entire life, I've been given nicknames like smiles and bubbles. And uh, my whole entire life, I've been called effervescent. I've been told I'm a radiant light. I get the question often, Frankie, why are you always smiling? And my answer is always, I don't know, I just do. And all of this is true. I am a happy person, but inside, behind that, I get trapped. My ego has, a, has developed around my true self and has identified things like negative emotions and called them wrong. It's easy to understand why I would have developed this train of thought. Whenever I saw negative emotions, they caused trouble. And when I expressed them, 
things didn't go well for me. Along with that, I learned that doing the right thing got me far in life. It made people around me happy when I was a good kid. I also associated, at some point in my life, praise with love. And, when, and my parents would praise me when I was being a good kid. And thus, I worked at being good in order to receive love. This got me good grades. Trying to be good and right motivated me to make healthy choices. My ego worked really well for me for a season. Because I'm sure you can already hear in here, there is a problem with my development of this philosophy inside of me, this subconscious train of thought. I still experienced negative emotions. But what I would do with them is I'd squish them back in and press them down with the hopes that somewhere inside of me, they would internally combust, never to arise again. Right? Does that, doesn't that work? No. No, we know that it doesn't. And with time, as I began to experience more and more negative emotions, because life happened, it wasn't working anymore. I would look. I would look at the world and see that things were not as they should be. And when I looked at myself and saw that deep down inside things were not as they should be, I began to, become, began to feel a deep resentment towards myself. I'd get frustrated that I'm not what I should be and resent the world for all of its faults. And because I'm not what I should be, I'd become angry. I'd see my imperfections, and I'd hold my imperfections against myself as some sick form of motivation. And the cycle would continue of anger and resentment and anger and resentment. Ugh. <laughs> Resisting emotions is not helping me. It was when I began to feel and began to identify the things that I was feeling, the things that the emotions were trying to tell me about myself, about my misunderstanding, this messed up cycle I have gotten myself into. When I began to crack this open, God was able to speak because he was able to speak to the truth that I was finally seeing. And he told me this, that grace required nothing of me, which is a statement that I have heard and I've always known in my head but I wasn't living like that. All of my expectations that I held against myself, I couldn't live up to them. But God told me that those weren't his expectations for me, and that since grace required nothing of me, I was enough. My true self was enough. As you can see, this is kind of a deep work. It's not just a simple peeling back there's a lot more going on there. God had to do some pruning and then some purging of these negative roots inside of me. It's because our e egos, our bad habits, are deeply rooted. God is going to do some purging inside of us, of those nasty roots. But the truth is, is that when he pulls all of that away, he's not going to leave us empty. He's pulling it away so that it can expose our true selves and he will water and tend to that true self so that it can grow. But we need to get these roots out of the way. When I heard that grace required nothing of me and began to live like grace required nothing of me, God showed me that in my true self there was serenity, a real peace, and that there was holy perfection that had always been there. I just hadn't seen it. The temptation will be, I know, to give up or to go backwards. Everything in you will want to quit. To quit God, to quit your marriage, to quit your work, and maybe if we're honest, to quit life. If there is one thing that I can get across, one thing that I could get, if I could even just hold on to this, is to believe that God is working in you. On the other side of the wall, 
away from this stuck, away from this, but on the other side, something will be completely different, I promise. It'll be almost unexplainable. You'll be freer than you've ever felt. You'll be more clear of who you are and God's love for you. But you'll need to let the wall do its work. This is what I wanna remember when I hit another wall. I tried to go over it. I tried to, I tried to go around it. I tried to dig a hole under it, but none of it succeeded. When the pain of staying and being stuck became so unbearable I couldn't be here anymore, I finally decided I was gonna do what I thought I couldn't do. And I was going to walk through the wall. This is where we enter the next stage, the waiting stage. Stop trying to hold up your wall. Stop trying to resist it. It feels like it is the problem. But there's a mystery, a paradox that God has been revealing, and it is this. It says in Matthew 5, verse 3, that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think it, yeah, blessed are the spiritually poor, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. We don't like to admit it, but sometimes we need to get to that place, to be spiritually poor. But we try to hold up the wall, try to hold it in place. It feels like it's going to crush in on us, and so we, we keep it propped up as best we can. We hold ourselves together. But when we decide to go through it, we reach through and we realize that God is there and we can hold on to him and this wall that felt so impenetrable becomes a wall of water and its wave crashes over us. Waves come in all different sizes. When I was a kid, I would go camping on Lake Couchin. It's on Vancouver Island. And in the evening, the waves would come crashing in onto the shore. And those waves would come up to like your waist and sometimes up to your shoulders. But those weren't big waves. I'd seen big waves. I had gone to Parksville, and Parksville is a town on the ocean. And so you'd seen ocean waves, and those ones are big. Those are big waves. I remember standing, like running into them and standing in them, and they would come rushing over your head, and they kind of grab a hold of you and pull you forward, and you go like face plant into the sand. Those were big waves. But then I went to Hawaii. Whew! Some of you know those waves are monstrosities. I remember coming, we went down this path and we we're going to this little tiny beach that we heard about. And I remember like going down the path and we're thinking, oh, we're gonna put down our blankets, we're gonna go for a little dip in the water, and then we're gonna bask in the sun, because we're in Hawaii. This sounds great. So we go down the path and I remember stepping over the crest of the beach so you could see down to the water and just stopping. This beach was in kind of like a rock inlet, and there were these waves that were coming in, and they were ginormous. They were taller than buildings. Like, I'm talking three to four stories tall. And these aren't like the waves that you see in the movies that people like surf on, and they're like, Phew. No, it wasn't like that. Because they're in this rocky inlet, these waves were coming in, building up. And because there was nowhere for them to curve out to, they would come crashing with so much force and so much sound that I actually stood at the top of that beach going like, this is what awe of God feels like. Because I was struck with almost like this powerful fear inside of me of these waves that were way down there. These were like the waves in the movies that eat ships. Like if it gets you, it's pulling you under and it's not spitting you back out. These waves are our walls. This type of wave has the power and the might that you can't handle. But I don't need to tell you that. You already know that. That's why you have avoided it. 
I remember someone, I don't remember who asked me this question, but they said, Frankie, what if you stop trying? Stop trying to be afraid and let yourself fear. Let fear show you what lies you believe. What if you stop trying to hold it all together and let yourself fall apart? I can tell you, it'll feel like death. The wave will crash over you and it's gonna knock out your wind and your knees all in one go. And then it's gonna do it again. It would be more than you can handle, and it would pull you out to sea. But when you initiated the crash of this wave, when you pushed through the wall, you grabbed God. And God, <laughs> God makes all the difference. God will have you. He's gonna hold you, and as the waves beat you, and strip you, and wash you of the layers of your false self, God will be right there. He's gonna be your anchor, your strength, and your hope. With time, it's gonna feel like the biggest ones have already hit. And then, another one's gonna rise up and hit you. I'm sorry, but it's true. But with more time, and with more stripping, and with more bearing and holding on to God, the waves are gonna lessen. They are going to dissipate, and eventually, eventually, the water is just going to be lapping at your feet, and you are going to be free. The wall is going to be gone, and the path for the rest of your journey is ahead of you, and you can take a step. You are going to be free. This is you reborn, a new creation. God promises us freedom. You can have, be, have freedom from your wall. I know some people who have been through great suffering and they have hit their walls, but their walls have not changed them. And they, have had, they have hit their walls and bounced off again only to come back later on in life and hit their walls again and, well, bounce off. These people are left bitter and angry because brokenness only has two options. It can either be transformed or transferred. You probably know someone who is transferring pain instead of letting it be transformed. Hey, let's be honest, maybe it's me. I don't know. Although they cope, they miss the gift that their wall has to give. The question is, how long will the waves keep beating up against you? And how long will this all take? The finished work is going to take a different length of time for everyone. For some people, it might take days, others months. Myself included, it can take years. But we can choose to trust, experience our brokenness to its fullest, obey and remain faithful when everything else in us wants to run and quit. Because we are holding tight to God while the waters are crashing around us and it is God who is our support through it. And it's here that we experience the rising. To be clear, the second half of our journey isn't a chronological date. You don't have to be a certain age to get there. There are 10-year-olds in children's hospitals who are further along in their journey than some 80-year-olds because they have been transformed through their pain. People in the second half of their journey, they just don't, they look the same on the outside, but there's something different about them. On the other side of the wall, I explain it like this. 
that the truths that you believed in your head have become truths that you now practice in your heart. I use the example, I can tell a person every day that they are beautiful, but they won't feel it until they believe it for themselves. Truth was always there. And now that your ego has been removed, it is no longer complicating it. I shy away from saying that the wave is worth it. The brokenness, it's not. I would never say that about my brokenness. I'd never say that to yours as you're going through it. But if you have stepped on the other side and you have experienced freedom, you know that the brokenness is necessary. It's worth it for the freedom. The freedom is worth it. When you step on the other side of the wall, there are a few characteristics that will begin to appear in yourself that you will know that you are rising. The first is a greater brokenness, which is a silly thing to say. I thought we got past that. But this brokenness is different. Before the wall, we prefer to exercise our right to know right from wrong, instead of letting God do that work. After the wall, we know better. We know our own brokenness and we have seen it and experienced it to its fullness, but have also experienced love in spite of it. A second characteristic is the great mystery or the unknowing. It's appreciating God beyond every concept I have of him. Augustine said, if you understand, it is not God you understand. Going through the wall will require a full release of control, and then you can experience a childlike mystery. This great unknowing allows me to rest more easily and trust God is in control, and I am not. I begin to live that, not just know it. A third characteristic is the deeper ability to wait. The driving, the grasping, the fearful must produce, must make something happen, must get something done in case God doesn't. That's gone because it's what kept you stuck at the wall in the first place. And now there is a peace and a rest knowing that you can't run ahead of God. And the last, and the fourth is a greater detachment. You will know, you'll begin to believe and live that this journey is not to say, I am happy. The point of the journey is to say, I am free. We live our lives the same as the rest of the world. We get married, perhaps. We experience sorrow and joy. We buy things and we use them. But always, always aware that these things in and of themselves are not our lives. The greater detachment is not apathy. It's not that you don't feel and you don't care. You're actually gonna do a lot more of that. But in the feeling and in the caring, you are secure. It's an understanding that deeper than all of this is your value and your meaning. It's deeper. Apart from all of it, you are. You are your true self. You are your essence. Your inherent image of God. You are created and a new creation. You are broken and healed. You have experienced a death and a resurrection inside of you. The old is gone the new has begun and you are vulnerable and in vulnerableness you can truly be loved and truly give love in return because the layers of the ego aren't there to impede it anymore this is freedom and this is the promise that Christ gives to us this is God's purpose for you 
Some of you this morning, you might not be at a wall and you might not be stuck. And that is good. That's a really good thing. I hope that you can take some of this message and just store it in your heart. Because when you face a wall, you might need it. But some of you are my friends and I know, I know some of you are feeling stuck. And so, I just want to walk through this with you. If you just want to close your eyes for a minute, we're just going to feel. Let go of the thoughts and begin to feel. Before you opens a path, and that path is the path of your life. Just imagine yourself walking down it. You're walking through life and you're going along. Just see your life before you as you've played it out. And then, if you can, imagine a wall on that path. Where were you on your path when that wall appeared? was going on at that time? Was there something that was going on? Or was there just nothing? It just came out of nowhere. Can you allow yourself to feel stuck? Maybe just for a moment this morning, let yourself really feel the stuck. Emotional, healthy spirituality is going to allow us to feel both a trust in God and a full brokenness. God is big enough to have it all. If you're angry, be angry. Admit that there's anger, disappointment, resentment. I don't know what it is that has you stuck there, but what are you feeling there and what has just eaten away at your soul? This is the pain. And if you're willing, if you're willing this morning, I know no safer place than this because this is where I do this myself. Imagine what would it feel like to have tried to go over, around, and under, and it didn't work. And so finally, you let go, and you let God, and you reach through that wall, and you grab him, and the wall begins to crash if you can let it. Dear God, I know you have a hold of me. I know because you have taken me through waves. And you've begun to reveal to me my true self, the one that you see, the one that you are so fond of, the one that you are so excited about. God, I don't understand your mystery. I don't understand why you give us these paradoxes of being need, need, that our healing needs to come through brokenness, that there is beauty in the broken. But God, I'm going to trust it. I'm going to trust it. I'm going to live my life trusting it. God, this morning, I'm reaching out to you. Some of us may have reached out to him before and we're going to do it again because we know his faithfulness. Some of us this morning, this may be the first time you've ever even imagined reaching out to God. And I'm going to tell you right now, he's got you. There is some brokenness inside of us that we need to accept. And God, I pray that it transforms because I am tired of it. God, I pray over these people that as they go throughout their weeks and their lives and their years and their life, God, that you are going to make something beautiful out of their broken. I thank you for that. I'm accepting that who you've created me to be is 
worth all the grace that you have to give. I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. I told you it wasn't going to be fun, but it's going to be worth it. I know some of you still have some things you want to deal with, maybe, just to maybe give some more release and to let some more waves crash. This is a safe place to do that. So this morning, if you need to do some of that, just take a moment. Just remain in your seats. It's totally fine. Friends around you will be doing the same thing. I'm going to get the prayer team to come up here, and there'll be a few people. If you feel that you could just use some hands to hold, to be that representation of God holding you through a wave, they'll be here. And they would love to just pray over you um, and give you some encouragement, be a partner with you through this. That's totally okay too, because this is necessary to become who God wants us to be. To everyone else, I say thank you so much for listening to my story. I want to hear yours, so please come at some point. And like I said, introduce yourself. Um, but go and be free. That's what God wanted for you initially. Have a good week, guys.